Hello. Welcome. Um, thank you for coming out early on the last day um, for uh, the Christine Darden lecture. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ricardo Cortez, um, who is a professor at Tulane University. Um, some uh, honors and uh, awards that are uh, noteworthy are the Blackwell Tapia Prize in 2012, and he was in the 2021 class of AMS Fellows. Um, I, I wanted to share a, a little something that's, that's not like standard biography, but just a, a note of history and fact. So this Christine Darden lecture is rather new. Some may remember the <laughs> inaugural lecture being given online, pandemic style. Um, and Ricardo was one of the, was the chair of CMPM, the Committee on Minority Participation in Mathematics. It really pushed for this lecture to be part of the MathFest program. Um, for a while, we'd been involved in the Haberowski Gates Tepia McBay lecture that, that's at JMM, and there was no equivalent. Um, and not only was there no equivalent, but it was really important that this is a real invited address, you know, on a plenary, being recorded um, so that everyone can enjoy it. And, uh, and Ricardo was really important in helping to move the conversations, getting this established, and also uh, the Haberowski Gates to P.M. McBay lecture elevated to an invited address um, that continues at the joint meetings. So not only um, a great mentor, a, a, a person who has received a lot of accomplishments, but has continually given back uh, to the community. So it's my pleasure to welcome him now to uh, the stage. Thank you, Ricardo. Thank you, Kelly. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for that uh, introduction. I, I'm really excited to be here because um, I've been a fan of Dr. Darden's for a long time. And uh, I, I know of her work and I know of her dedication to education and, and mentorship. And so it's a great honor for me to be given this lecture. Let me see if this works. Yeah, so this presentation is about uh, some, how mathematics can be used to advance scientific understanding. And the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to talk to you about some of my research in computational fluid dynamics. And I'll guide you through that. Uh, it's going to be more about microorganisms swimming around. And uh, this is all motivated by questions that biologists have. And uh, at the end of the, towards the end of the lecture, I, I will also touch about, touch on the modeling uh, process and how that connects to K-12 education, because I know many of you are interested in, 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 that, in that subject, as I am. So before we start, uh, I wanted to just have a quote by Dr. Darden that seems to be particularly uh, relevant to this talk. And uh, this, this is about her interest in, in mathematics and engineering and how it relates to, to real world problems. So let me uh, give you a little bit of uh, some, some background so that you can see where we, where we are. This is a, a graph of salmonella, so it's a bacterium. Uh, this is very tiny, the flagella. Each flagellum is about maybe 20 microns long, and the cell body is, is, is also small. The thickness of the flagellum is maybe 20 nanometers, so these are very tiny things, and uh, they swim around. Uh, many of these flagellas, you can see, come off the body from many different sides, and they often form a bundle so they can propel themselves in a swimming motion. So we have questions about how, what, the, what the design is. Why is it designed this way? Is it optimizing something? Usually the flagella have many functions, so it's difficult to say that it should be optimized for one particular function. Here's uh, another, this is a, a little movie uh, about uh, a particular bacterium which has only one flagellum. So this is nice to study for, from a mathematical point of view. Uh, let me see if I can play this again. 
and so the way uh, you can see how they swim in some direction and then they reorient and go in a different direction, they do that by, by stopping their motors. They have a molecular motor that rotates the flagellum. And after they do that, uh, they stop it for a little bit and then they restart it and then go off in a different direction. Uh, another situation is in, in, in reproduction. So we have spermatozoa that are uh, fertilizing an egg. And as I hope you can see it. There's a, there's a region around the egg. It's called uh, the zona pellucida. And that is a completely different environment. So the, the sperm have, have to change the way they, they wiggle the flagellum in order to penetrate that, that region and fertilize the egg. So we have questions about how, how that happens, uh, including some biochemistry that happens along the way. And I'm also going to concentrate today on this particular organism is a coanoflagellate. So coanoflagellates, I, I added a little schematic there so you can see a little bit of what it looks like. The picture uh, is hard to see, but it, it's also a cell body with a flagellum. And then they ha it, has, it has this, uh, uh, this cone like, like a little uh, set of microvilli, and uh, they use that to capture prey. Uh, you, I don't know if you can see in the bottom picture that the, those little round things are bacteria that they have captured in the, in the little cone that they have. Uh, so this is how they capture prey to, to feed themselves, and the idea is that they, call, they form colonies and, and they, they wiggle their flagellum in such a way that they bring nutrients towards them to capture. So how does this happen? This is an important microorganism to study because it exists as a, as a single cell and also as a multi-cell colony. Okay, and then one, one last uh, piece of information is we also are interested in artificial swimmers because this is now uh, a, very, a very important feature in, in the research, trying to create microscopic artificial swimmers that eventually can be put into your body and, and be controlled so that they can go and deliver drugs to specific areas of the human body. That, that's the idea. Okay, so that's the setup for what we're going to talk about. And how does mathematics figure into all of this? I think of it as having these three sides to the to the research, there's theory, there's experiments, and there's computer simulations. And behind the computer simulations, there's the mathematical modeling that goes on, and that's where most of the mathematics is. And uh, the idea is that each of these components can inform the others. So whatever we find mathematically, if we are able to find something interesting in some parameter range, for example, then we can talk to our collaborators, our experimentalists, to see if they can design experiments to, to verify those findings. Okay, so what do we need? Um, we need at least these three pieces. We need uh, some kind of model for the fluid motion. So there's fluid all around, so the fluid is going to move and, and move things around it. How does the fluid move? Well, it's because the flagella along the organisms and also along the, the cell bodies, they develop forces and those forces push the fluid around and that's what creates the motion. And then as the fluid moves, then the, the, the geometry changes and then uh, everything gets in a feedback loop and, and it starts over. So that's roughly the, the, the plan. So uh, we, what we would like to, to, to find is, if possible, we don't want to impose the, the, the motion of the flagellum. We want it to emerge as part of the solution. Sometimes this is not possible, uh, especially in early models, but, but we try. And, and then we try to see uh, also add, add some features to the environment, especially when we have those filamentous networks around. Okay, so let me, let me tell you a little bit about the fluid motion. Uh, most, I think most fluid dynamics models start with the Navier-Stokes equations. These are the, these are the equations that are in, 
in dimensionless form, so, so the dimensions have been taken out, and you can see u is the, this is just representing essentially uh, force equals ma. All the forces are on the right side, and the, the acceleration terms are on the left side. And the, the capital F that you see there, that's going to be the, the forces that the organisms are introducing into the fluid, pushing it around. But you see a coefficient there on the left side. It's the Reynolds number. And it's the only coefficient that is not equal to 1 in this equation. And that depends on the problem you're doing. So there's a little schematic there. And the Reynolds number is defined at the bottom. It's, it's the density times some kind of speed of, or, or scale for the velocity and a scale for the, for the length of the problem. So for example, if you're swimming around, maybe your length scale is about five or six feet, and you're swimming, I don't know how fast you swim, but if I swim slowly, but uh, so, so your Reynolds number might be something like 10,000 or something like that uh, in water. But if you're a fish, maybe that goes down to about 100. And if the, the smaller scale you are, the, the lower this number is. So for, for microorganisms, the Reynolds numbers are maybe around 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5. And so we make the simplification that that's small enough that the left side of this equation is just going to be set to 0. So we're going to assume this is 0. And then we have what's known as the Stokes equations at the top there. All the acceleration terms are gone. In fact, any, any time derivative is, is missing. So the idea is that when you push on, on a fluid like this at that scale, the, the acceleration happens immediately, and then you reach a steady state velocity. So this is what would happen if you were to swim in honey or something like that. You, you just push the push the honey, as long as you're applying force, there's motion, but as soon as you stop applying force, everything stops, and there's no inertia. So uh, mathematically, uh, if, you, if you remember from a, or if you've taken a PDE course, uh, uh, we usually find fundamental solutions to this problem. So this is a linear problem. We can find a fundamental solution, which means that we apply a force at a point, which is a delta function force, so it's, a, it's really a distribution. And you get a solution. The solution is at the bottom there. And what you notice is that this is typical of, of fundamental solutions. There's a singularity. For example, r is the distance from the point where you apply the force to the point where you evaluate the fluid velocity. So when r is 0, you have, you have an indeterminate form. This is OK if the forces are distributed over surfaces, because then you really have to integrate this expression. And if you integrate 1 over r over a surface, that you get something finite. But uh, what if you wanted to represent the flagellum with a curve, for example? So if you have a, a model that this, the flagellum is represented by a curve, then suddenly this is no longer integrable, because a line integral doesn't converge. So um, people do other things to try to get around this, this issue. But what we have done in the last 20 years or so is introduce a different way of looking at it. And we think of it as, instead of being a force at a point, we think of it as a force spread over a small sphere, like a little ball. And so, so just imagine that the forces, instead of all concentrated at one point, there's a little Gaussian function or Gaussian looking function that spreads the force over some, some small little region. And I have some examples of such functions here. The technical term for these functions is blob. That's what they're called in the, in the literature. And so when we have blobs that have certain properties, in particular, if, if they are radially symmetric, then uh, we can actually compute the exact solution w with that particular forcing. So I go back to the derivation of the fundamental solution. And instead of using a delta function force, I put this blob. You can see it there on the top. And then you can find a solution which is written at the bottom. And if you happen to remember the fundamental solution from the previous slides, as epsilon goes to 0, you, you end up with the same expression. So 
epsilon somehow determines how, how fat these blobs are and how close you might be to, to, this, to the traditional fundamental solution. But for us, really, what the way to look at it is to think about the forces along, the f along this filament. Uh, think of it as the filament as being the center line of, of the flagellum, and then there's like a little cloud of points all around it in some small extent. OK, so I hope that makes some, some sense to you. It, it gives you an idea of the methods that we're using. Now we can use that equation at the top. This, if, if there's any takeaway from this slide is that if you apply a force in, in these fluids, the formula at the top tells you the velocity field everywhere that is induced by that force. So we have a way of computing flow velocities from forces. Okay. So uh, these are, I, I said that, these are exact solutions. And uh, we can control how fat those blobs are with the parameter epsilon. And so what some people like, what they like to do is to use uh, epsilon as the radius of the flagellum so that we can think about the forces being spread over just the, the extent of the flagellum. And occasionally, instead of having forces and computing the velocity in the fluid due to the forces, we sometimes have the, the, the motion of the flagellum we have the velocities and we need to find the forces. So we have to do the inverse problem. And this is also possible to, to invert. Okay, so um, now let me show you some examples. This is going to be an example first of a bacterium through a viscoelastic region. Uh, this is s similar to the, to the sperm penetration problem. But uh, also bacteria do this. Uh, they have to navigate through regions that look like, like these. Uh, and, and so one of the things to notice is that th this is a porous region. Okay, there, there's, there's filaments, there's polymers, there's all kinds of things, and there are gaps in between them, and, and the, the, the organisms swim through the gaps. But the gaps are more or less of the same order, the same size as the organisms themselves. So, uh, it's difficult to, to justify a continuum description of this fluid because it's at the same scale, the holes are at the same scale as the organism. So we have decided to use uh, something like a network of, of points. So let me, let me see if this makes sense. What we think about it is a, f a fluid. This is a viscous fluid. Let's say this room is filled with a viscous fluid. And then there's some region, a subset of the region, where there's going to be elasticity. So you can think of it as a mucus region, for example, in the body, where there's some elasticity to it. So what we do is we, we model that as a cloud of points, some of which are connected to other points by springs, for example. So when the fluid moves these, these points around, the springs stretch a little bit, and then the springs uh, try to contract it, and that provides an elasticity uh, to, the, to the motion. It's not just a spring, actually. It's something called a Maxwell element. So it's a spring and a dash pod, which means that when, uh, when the spring, if you stretch the spring, instead of coming back to its original length, when you let go, it comes back only partially because uh, it, it tends to open. So that's why we have an equation for the force on the spring, but we also have an equation for the resting length of the spring, which can change as, as the forces are applied. And then this is our model uh, for this particular project. This is a model of, of a bacterium. It's uh, going to be a, a spherical. So there's, a, there's an assumption here that we can represent the cell body with a sphere. It, it's not quite as spherical in, in real life. And then we have a, a, a helical flagellum, which turns. It, and so this, the, the turning pushes the, the cell body and m moves it forward. And this is something like corkscrewing itself in a, in a very viscous fluid. And you can see a little bit of the, the, the mesh that we have on the, on the surface of this organism, which is what we use to compute the forces. So there will be forces developed along the, the, the surface of this organism. And as it pushes through this, this region, this network of viscoelastic elements, uh, they develop forces too, which push back and, and so then there's some interaction of it. 
and we want to, we want to find out uh, what what this looks like. Okay, uh, so there's one little bit of information that I have to tell you. It, organisms cannot just develop suddenly develop a net force to push themselves. Like we can't just pull ourselves up and and jump in the air. So they have to have a net force of zero in the end. So that has to be enforced somehow. So we, what we do is we add two variables, a translation and a, and a rotational velocity, and then we impose the conditions to make sure that the net force and the net torque on the organism are zero. Okay, that might be a technicality, but it's important. So here are some, some of the results. It's hard to see at the bottom, but we were, uh, we were looking at different uh, properties of the mesh, and so this is, uh, E represents the stiffness of the springs, and eta is somehow related to the, how compliant this is. So uh, you can see here that in this particular case, there's very little deformation of the, of the network as the, as, the, as the swimmer goes through it, and, but at the bottom, it's hard to see, but if you just focus on the blue curve, uh, I, I put a line there, but it's hard to see. The, it, 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 it makes it through the network, but it slows down quite a bit as it's going through it, uh, down to about 25% of the speed that the organism would have if there was no network around. But what if we change the properties of the network so we make it a little bit more compliant. This means that as you, as you uh, stretch the springs, they tend to modify their resting length. And so you can see there's a little bit more deformation. And what I wanted you to focus on is at the very end of the, of the bottom graph, the, it go, the, the speed of the swimmer goes above the speed that it would have without the network. So somehow the, the energy that is stored in the springs of the network have, a, have an effect that gives it a boost of speed at the end. And if the network is much more compliant, then it just it, it's like, it's like, uh, like taffy or something. You're, you're just pu pulling it and it's sticking to the tail and it's, it's, it's eventually all these swimmers, once they go past the, the network, they all end up having this, the speed that they have in, in, without the network. That's, so this is a graph of the position versus time. So the slopes are the speed, and that line you see at the beginning is the speed of the, the swimmer without any network. And then you can see the slopes are, are, are smaller while it's in the network. This is where it slows down. And eventually it comes out, it comes out and it re regains the, the full speed. But it takes different amounts of time depending on the properties of the network. So, so this is a way of, for us to study how the environment is affecting the, the motion of these, these swimmers, especially when you have a prescribed uh, motion of, of the flagellum. All right, uh, let me switch gears to a different application. This is the Koano flagellate, so I'm going to remind you what they look like. This is the left is the experimental picture that I showed you before. Uh, in reality, this is, is, is like a cone of, of filaments that are relatively rigid. And uh, you can see at the bottom, the experimental picture shows how the, the bacteria, which is the, the food, gets stuck to their, their microvilli, the cones. And so, uh, on the right, obviously, is our, our depiction of this. So this is our computational model. We have, uh, it's not a spherical body anymore. It's got a little bit uh, of the shape that it's supposed to have. And we have a cone of microvilli. What we do have is, a, 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 we don't have the bacteria actually in the, in the model at the moment. So what we do is we look at the fluid motion around the organism and we look at the flux. So we look at how much fluid goes into the collar. You see that little gray region at the top right? So how much fluid goes into the collar? This is uh, a proxy for us to determine whether prey would be captured if it was, if it was swimming 
near there. And then what we do too is we look at when we have a bunch of prey stuck to the collar, then uh, what happens to the motion of, how does that affect the motion of the, of the organism? So here's a couple of animations. One, the one on the left has no bacteria attached to the, to the microvilli, and the one on the right has several, I forget how many. And this is just a simulation. Everything else is the same, so we wanted to know how much faster or how much slower this, the, the organism swims if, uh, if it has prey attached to, to it. And I'm just going to let you watch it, but it's, it's, it's clear that It's not very clear, but <laughs> I, I, think, I think one stopped. The one on the left moves faster <laughs> before it stopped. <laughs> so uh, here are some, here are some, some of the results that we, that we found that the, the bacteria capture on the color uh, slow down the swimming, and this is uh, per perhaps an obvious result, but it has to do with two, two issues. One is that the, the fact that they have bacteria stuck on the collar, make the, them, they make the fluid motion go around them, and they modify the fluid motion, so that affects the, the speed. But also, they're, they're, they're uh, covering part of the area of, on the collar, so then it, it makes it more difficult to to attract uh, new bacteria. Uh, let's see. Uh, we also computed some other things like uh, feeding efficiency, which is uh, the, 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 the number of prey captured per work to produce the feeding currents. We, we computed the work to produce a certain feeding current, and that increases slightly with the number of prey. So in other words, the more prey you have stuck to your collar, the more work you have to do to create the feeding currents that you need to, to bring some more. So this is just to give you an idea of, of the type of, of problems that we're addressing. We do this in collaboration with biologists who do the experiments, and uh, they give us data, so we can include data, for example, the, the geometry, the lengths of the flagella, and things like that in our models. And then, uh, then we have once we have our model, then we can use our computers as if it's our little laboratory and change parameters and play around with it and see what we can find interesting uh, and if we can answer the questions that the biologists have. W one of the things that happens in, in experiments is that, um, for example, in this particular case, if, if the experimentalists want to, want to capture the, the motion of a colony, for example, they have to have a certain magnification factor in their, in, the, in their studies. And if they want to capture a single organism, the, it's a whole different magnification factor. So it's very difficult for them to capture both things at the same time. And, and so uh, it's difficult to get data like that. But we report our findings to them, and then we, th this is how the collaboration uh, continues. This is, a, this is a nice picture, I think. This is the fluid motion that is generated by a single organism all around itself. This is the instantaneous streamlines, it's called. So you can see how the rotations happen around, uh, around the organism. These are the kinds of, uh, of, of pictures that are hard to get uh, experimentally. Okay, so what we're doing now is looking at, beginning to look at colonies, even though, uh, for, for example, this particular picture is a colony of two organisms, so it's just a pair. But for example, what would happen, we asked ourselves the question, what would happen if the flagella of these two organisms are beating in antiphase, so it's like a mirror image of each other. And so you can see the fluid motion looks very symmetric about some line between them, right? And, and so you, we can compute how much flux goes into the collar 
as a way of computing whether how, how, how much prey they might capture. And then we look at what if the, what if the flagella are not anti-phase, but actually in phase, uh, for example, like this. You can see, let me go back, this, this is very symmetric, and, and this is not. And you can see how it moves from one side to the other one. And it turns out that this particular motion, when they're in phase, leads to a larger flux through the collar, which makes, makes it seem like it would be uh, better for feeding purposes. So if you have a colony, this is just a colony of two. But this is an ongoing study. In fact, uh, there's an undergraduate student that is leading this, this, this particular project. Okay, so uh, a few words about the modeling, the modeling process. We, we tend to simplify, as, as most modelers do, right? We tend to simplify the, the biology uh, in order to get some, something uh, that, we can, that we can handle. And then gradually we add some features to the biology to, to make it more realistic and more, more relevant. Uh, we are, uh, we, we tweak the models to improve the computation. So sometimes the, the representation of the organisms stays the same, but the methods that we use behind the scenes are, are changed or, or adjusted to improve the accuracy or the speed of the computation. Many of these simulations take days to compute, for example. So uh, we have to do something to speed them up and, and be able to compute in a reasonable time and also to improve their representation. Um, so to, to improve that, we have to have a way of assessing how we're doing and the uh, interaction with collaborators uh, and, and revise the model element. So this, uh, this, this revision and, and, and improvement of the models, so some of the features take a few weeks or, or something, but some, some of the, the, the general progress takes years, really. And so coming back to Dr. Darden, I was looking at, at her publications, and uh, I don't know if you know, but her, her work is in fluid dynamics also, but it's really in very fast fluid motion. She, was, she, she did work on minimizing the sonic boom in, in airplanes. And so uh, here's, a, here's a quote from a paper of hers in, from, the, from the 70s, where she talks about the methods that, that were used at the time, and uh, the, 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 Mac, the, the speed was, the, the, this cone that she's talking about is, is the cone of uh, the, the, the sonic boom, cause the, the pressures co create a cone of, of discontinuity, which is when, you, when it hits you, that's when you hear the sonic boom. And so there was some, some approximation, it was treated as a plane, she said, and, and the disturbances are assumed to arrive uh, at, at the observer at the same time. So there was some simplification that is being done here in order to, to be able to, to move forward. And then uh, when 15 years later or so, uh, there was another publication where she talks about uh, assessing these, this particular model and using a different model which has now nonlinear features and uh, deciding that the, the linear model that they were using before has some limitations. It was okay for some, ra some range of values, but it has some limitations. And so uh, the, the nonlinear model was, was more adequate for certain cases. So I think this is uh, a way of, uh, this exemplifies the, the modeling process, I think, in her work also because uh, it's, it's always, there, there's always, there's a constant assessment of the methods and improvement of the methods, whether it takes a day or a year or 10 years. So uh, I, I've been working with some math educators on, on mathematical modeling in K-12, especially in the last 10 years since the Common Core State Standards came up uh, and, and and included mathematical modeling in K-12. And so uh, I've been thinking a lot because the, my collaborators in math education asked me, what, what do you go through in the modeling process, right? So I have never thought about it so much. 
in my life uh, and to try to analyze how, how I do things. And uh, so we have investigated how people learn mathematical modeling and how people develop the competencies that go with uh, mathematical modeling, in particular for the teacher preparation programs in, 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 in various universities. And what is interesting to me is that the same modeling process that I might go through is really the same process that we're teaching the students. There's something unique about mathematical modeling, I think, that it's really the same process at all levels, in my opinion. It's just maybe the sophistication of the mathematics is different, and, and the, but, but the general idea of the process is really the same. So, as part of this, uh, of this work, I, I created a, a, a course. In fact, it was, it was uh, inspired by an MAA publication. And uh, one of the recommendations was to, to, to bring mathematical modeling to the early years of undergraduate uh, education. Because typically, if, I don't know how it is at your institutions, but mathematical modeling is often reserved for junior level or senior level courses. And so that means the students have to have many math courses behind them before they can, they can go to them. And we wanted to increase the access to math modeling to, um, to more students. So uh, we created this course where there was a prerequisite of Calc 1 or equivalent. And, and I like, uh, I, to me, this was important because equivalent meant if they've done a little bit of calculus in high school or something, that was, that was good. And uh, we created this, this. So this was a non-traditional way of teaching modeling because if you look at the, the textbooks in mathematical modeling, often what they have is uh, a classification of models rather than the modeling process. And so we want to just emphasize the creativity that goes with creating model, uh, models from scratch. And we let the students do, uh, use whatever mathematics they, they know to do that. And you can see at the bottom some of the list of topics, but I'm going to show you a couple of examples. For instance, so imagine a course with undergraduates of different majors, different years, sitting together doing, doing some, some of these problems. So, for example, you go to the grocery store, you buy some stuff, and then you have to choose a, 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 a lane to, to pay. So, how do you, what do you take into account in order to, to try to get out of there as soon as possible? So, the students do all kinds of things, right? They, 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 they try to divide the, the, the items they buy into some, some that are scannable, some that are not scannable, or the ones they have to weigh, or something like that. And then there's always a discussion about what to do with random kinds of events where somebody wants to pay and the credit card doesn't work, or something like that. And so uh, how do they take into account those things in a mathematical model? Here's another example. Uh, for example, if I show you a photograph of a crowd, uh, it, let's say it's, it's a, it's, it could be a, a concert, it could be a political rally, it could be uh, a march for science, it could be something like that. How can you determine how many people are there from the photograph? So in this case, for instance, uh, the students tend to, well, one of the things they do is they, they take the picture, they divide it into, they, they draw a grid on it, and, and try to make boxes and then try to figure out how, much, how many people are in one box and then somehow scale it up. Uh, but of course, there's a perspective, right? So this has been chosen carefully so that, that there's a, a perspective here. So uh, they, they tend to do other things. But one, one nice thing about these problems is that at some point, whatever the students do, even if they do what I just said, it, it's really uh, approaching something that looks like calculus, right? Eventually, if you make enough boxes, if you, if you took this limit, you'll be doing a double integral of some density function on a rectangle. And so the, the calculus topics come up naturally, in a way, as part of the, of the problem, rather than the other way around. 
teaching double integrals and then doing an application or something like that. So we did this in, I did this in my university and my collaborators uh, were doing in some, of, some other places. And so then we joined this group uh, of uh, several institutions and this modules was, is a project that uh, was used to, we develop materials for, for instructors at university courses, particularly courses where there would be uh, future teachers. And uh, the, the modules project includes several, several topics. There's, there, there, there's materials in geometry, in algebra, in statistics, and in mathematical modeling. So uh, I was part of the team that did mathematical modeling, and we created uh, three modules. Each module could be as long as uh, a couple of weeks worth, worth maybe more. And uh, so we have maybe 20 lessons with, with, with material for the instructor. It's not just the task, but also materials for the instructors and background information and handouts and assessment tools and all kinds of things. And now it's been taken. Uh, many people are using them. We had pilot faculty trying this out in various places in the country. And now uh, we, have, we have edited this and, and it's being used. If you're interested, you can just uh, write you know, look for modules, the website, and then you can write and get the materials. Okay, I have a, a little bit of time, but I just wanted to make sure I mentioned my collaborators. These are collaborators both in, 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 the, in both parts of the talk, the, the, the mathematics of the microorganisms and also uh, for the math education part. And uh, I thank you for being here. And if you have any questions or you want to have a conversation, I'm happy to do that. Thank you. Uh, we do have some time for questions. I would ask if those who are asking questions to line up at the microphone so that this is being recorded and then we'll be able to hear your question in the recording. Hi. Um, so the, the streamline visuals I thought were gorgeous, and so I have a question about them, partly so we can see them some more. <laughs> but um, I guess my question was, they seem to be two-dimensional, and the, um, the bacteria that this was based on exist in three-dimensional space, so I was wondering to what extent is your work done in two dimensions because, or is it shown in two dimensions because we can see it better, or maybe what's the modeling process between two and 3D? Yeah, sorry, I should have been more clear about that. The, the whole model is three-dimensional. Everything is three-dimensional. This particular picture is on a plane, mm -hmm. that, and in fact, it's the plane that contains the, the beat, uh, it's the beat plane of the, of the flagellum. Mm -hmm. So in fact, if you take a different plane, for example, a, a, a plane, perpendicular to this one, that's not where the flagellum beats. So the flow looks slightly different, uh, but this is all three-dimensional. I'm just showing it two-dimensional because it's very difficult to see 3D. <laughs> and yeah. when you talk about symmetry, um, is it in that same plane that you usually talk about when it, it's symmetric on both sides or not? Yes. Okay. Thanks. That's right. Thank you. Sorry. There. <laughs> okay, there, there's some pointing, but you, you, <laughs> you were there so first, nice. so I didn't want to be rude. <laughs> um, thank you very much for the interesting talk. Um, I had a question about why you have the flagellum as a curve instead of giving it some sort of um, finite thickness? Is it a modeling simplification or um, some sort of limitation uh, in terms of the ratio of the diameter of the, um, of the flagellum to the, um, I don't know, the, the top of it, side, the, the head? <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, I think this is, in, in fact, in the first, in the first uh, case, this one, mm -hmm. the flagellum was uh, a tube. Oh, okay. In this particular case, the flagellum is, is, a, 
it's like a tube like this with a surface. Mm -hmm. And in the second example, the flagellum was a curve. So I'm showing you one of each. And the second one, we chose to be a curve just because it's, the computations are more intense and we just needed to compute it faster. So it's faster to do it with a curve. But there could be something that, that, we, uh, that we miss with that. So uh, we could do it both ways. It's just that it was more expensive to do it this way and we needed the computation to be faster. Oh, yeah, completely understandable. And then this is maybe just a misunderstanding on my part, but um, it seemed that the um, the method that you have, the regularized Stokeslits, yeah. was specific for curves. Is that n not true? Is it also for surfaces? Actually, it's, 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 it can be used for forces on, on a surface or forces on a curve mm -hmm. or even scatter points with forces. It's, it's just kind of it unifies any, any of those cases because the, it removes the singularity. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. And then back to that side. My question is much less technical. Um, the modules that you mentioned at the end for a, an introductory course, are they to supplement an existing course or can you build a whole course by putting together a choice of those? You can do either one. So they're flexible. This is why they're, they're modules, right? So the, the modules have a certain coherence to them. So you can choose, let's say in, mod, in modeling, we have three modules, one, two, and three. You could choose one module, which has a, a few lessons, and that would not be a long, a, an entire course. So you could, you could use it as part of a course. Uh, you can use all three modules, and that, would be, that definitely would last you for, for a whole course. So it could be either, either way. Great. Thank you. And one Hi. more question over here. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for a wonderful talk. Uh, my question will be on the collaboration with the molecular biologists or biologists. Yeah. Uh, how do they dictate to you the parameters or do you start with your own model and then you tweak it later and then they do their experiments and therefore you tweak some more, refine some more and you know back and forth, trial and error. Thank you. Well, that's the hope. That's my hope. The uh, real collaboration. The real collaboration. So uh, I think that uh, we take a lot of what they do. We take their data, their measurements. And, and you read it. backgrounds of the, of the, the, the yeah. references, I guess, okay. And then our results, uh, we show them the results. We, so for example, for this particular coanoflagellate project, yeah. we meet weekly by Zoom and, and we show them what we have so far. And, and then they tell us, oh no, that's not interesting at all. Or a biologist would never wanna see that or you know, stuff like exactly. that. Exactly. <laughs> and in other times they say, oh, that's, that's kind of interesting. So and you pursue whatever you, they think is going to be in the real world, the, the real, uh, happening at, in real time in their lab yeah, when they we, experiment. Because that's the goal is to answer questions that the biologists care about. Yes. But so, however, I mm -hmm. must say that there's lots of interesting fluid dynamics problems that come out of it. Yeah, that neurons. Maybe, for maybe the biologists don't care about, but I do. I like them, and so I don't tell them about that. But <laughs> I, I, I pursue those uh, with my students, and then we 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 develop. Collaborate with others. Yeah, it, it helps us develop methodology and more mathematics behind it, and uh, yeah. try to prove convergence and. And yeah. other analytical issues. I was just thinking that you know before you, just, I, I was thinking that maybe you would be. It would be wonderful if you have like a procedural way of you know you start with your really simplistic uh, model and then you you tweak a few n numbers parameters and then you consult with them and then back and forth. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for coming and supporting uh, Ricardo and the Christine Darden Lecture. Thank you so much again.